So, uh, Sajad, thank you for, uh, for coming here all the way from Germany uh, for, for this. Um, I will, I'll give a first a quick uh, background of Sajad uh, for, for those folks who don't know. And then, uh, then let's talk a little bit about what's happening in the product space in, in automotive uh, and specifically uh, uh, you know, relative to the German ecosystem. So uh, uh, you've had a pretty illustrious career. Uh, you worked at BMW, at Mercedes. Uh, you were your board member uh, and currently you're at Porsche um, and uh, you're the board member is there as well. Um, bachelor's in electronics engineering and you've done some, some, uh, some executive training at Harvard. So, uh, so I think we'll have, to have a pretty fruitful conversation. Now your first automotive job though was right here, not too far from here in Palo Alto um, at Daimler. Um, what was the valley like in terms of automotive? I mean, we were joking earlier that I think even in five years ago or 10 years ago, you wouldn't be able to fill a room with people who knew automotive and software. And now it's, it's you know, you have conferences. Right, right. I think, uh, thank you for having me, first of all, because we're here. I think it's always great to be here in the valley and especially with the applied. I mean, where we are doing so many things together. Uh, back then, I mean, I was at the Page Mill Road over here and uh, it was like all this Daimler Chrysler. And we were at the baby steps at that time when we were talking about the either the kind of augmented reality or virtual reality and all those kind of things. AI and everything, that was just not there at that time. So I think this kind of things all came afterward, the data came afterward. And, and the software in general was so new to the automotive industry that we were just asking ourselves whether any one of the executives in the automotive industry uh, whether they will even listen to us. So we were working on a very low level, and we had never thought at that time that this one will become the core component of the automotive industry within the next 5, 10, 15, or 20 years. So where the software is now in automotive industry, I'm very honest with you, we had never even dreamed of that thing back then. So if you wanted to be an exec back then in the automotive industry, you had to come up either from the engine perspective or mechanical perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for all the folks who's been in the automotive industry for 20 plus years, the I think picking software at that time would be, not be would not be the consensus uh, consensus uh, view. Now, you you left there. You're at BMW, uh, where you're VP of a connected drive. Uh, this is in the connectivity era in the early teens. Um, what ended up being true and not true about connectivity, just as a kind of a pattern for us as we talk about kind of the most modern, you know, vehicle software problems that we're dealing with? Right. I mean, when we talked about the connectivity back then, and I'm talking about uh, 200, 2010, 2011, and at that time, it was even to make the e-call, that you can make an e-call and you have a SIM card in the vehicle. That's all about the connectivity back then. We are not talking about anything like uh, data, the big amount of data is being transferred between the cloud and the car or we are trying to talk about that, okay, whether remotely you can control the car, remotely you can, the over-the-air updates and all those kind of things. In the industry where I'm coming from, like from the German industry, those kind of things were like, okay, we have heard some of the companies called this Tesla and all those kind of people are doing something in the valley, but those kind of things were not there. So the connectivity at that time was only based on simple SIM card, and you can make an emergency call, and that was it. But afterward, it grew very quickly. So where it is now, I think it's amazing. That okay, within, and we are talking 2011, 2012. So within five to 10 years, it went like this kind of a scale. And uh, now without connectivity, you can't do anything in the vehicle. In, in that era, uh, do you recall the sentiment within the German automotive industry of Tesla and the emergence of Tesla at that time? And again, what ended up being true and not true? Because I think we're all sitting, we're constantly in the industry being bombarded by all of these new technologies. And uh, I think one of our responsibilities is where do you actually invest and where do you actually ignore? So uh, I can imagine some people said, in, you know, Tesla is a real thing and Mercedes invested in the company directly. And then some folks thought, hey, this is not a real thing. Uh, how, how is that then? I think uh, in general, it's my, my own view. I mean, uh, because uh, if I look at it, I have worked for uh, a couple of car makers in the European industry over there. So it's more or less, it goes like this, that okay, they have had a success based on electromechanical 
background and all that. So they were hearing, okay, something is happening in the Valley. One of the other company is coming. They are trying to put more focus on the software. But this kind of a, like DNA, which the companies had over there, that okay, we are either in the very sporty way or we are in a very luxury way and all those kind of things. These kind of companies cannot threaten us. And that will remain there for a time to come. And it will take another 20, 30 years before any other technology, in this case software, can be so important for our industry that we have to catch up very quickly. These thoughts were not there. But we also see now also that, okay, it's not only the, the Valley companies over here, which are coming from US, even the way that China has uh, catch up in the last years, that, okay, how important these new technologies have become for our industry. The, um, the, the, uh, do, do you think, broadly speaking, everyone, I think, in the automotive industry feels that you have to have a China viewpoint for sure, right? There's no debate of that. Do you think everybody in the automotive industry thinks you have to have a valley, you know, uh, uh, whether it's an office or a set of uh, understandings or executives from there or collaborations? Do you think that's, that's also considered to be kind of like an infallible truth? You have a point there. I think this thing was more important 15 years ago. Uh, and I would say at that time, it was like, if you're not in the valley, it means you're not the innovative company. You have to have an office there, whether you're doing something or not, that's a secondary part. Uh, but you have to have an office over there. But now, over the time, what has really happened is that uh, the China has also come up very aggressively in the automotive industry in a couple of fields. So now, while sitting in the middle, in the European industry over there, you look at the North America, you look at the China also, and then you say, okay, is my speed on this autobahn is right, or do I have to accelerate in a couple of technologies? And these are the questions which we are answering ourselves over there, that okay, what kind of a changes, what kind of a dynamic we have to bring from our side towards our industry to make sure that okay, we are also playing a bigger role over there. So my answer to that one would be, at the moment, I think what we see that okay, China is getting more done, shorter time, and is much more aggressive towards either electric technologies or even software technologies. The um, moving forward from kind of a, uh, that era, or I, I would say as a legacy of that era, OTA became a real conversation at that time. Tesla really promoted it. Uh, from a consumer ex expectation, you start experiencing it in 2016, 2017, where everyone's phones update and you don't think twice about it. And uh, all the, the OEMs talk a lot about OTA. I don't know if even half or even a quarter of the room who doesn't drive a Tesla would say, oh yeah, my car regularly updates and it regularly gets better. Where is that gap of what people, what the, uh, what the industry thinks of OTA and what consumers actually experience? I think uh, this OTA has both sides of it. One is innovation and one is the hype. So if you as an OEM, if you claim that, okay, we would not send any vehicle out in the market which would require OTA just to fix the bugs, then in the ideal case, you could say you don't need the OTA because at the time of the delivery, you just do the best one. And if you need OTA, you would like to have it to upgrade the features and all those kind of things. So this is also the mindset we have had all the time in the, in the premium industry over there. We were saying, okay, we will ship the best product. So we don't want to send anything out there which should require OTA to fix the bugs and all that. But at the moment, the way the features are being developing incrementally, either in the forms of infotainment or in the terms of driver assistance and all that, OTA has become the backbone of everything. And I would say, in this case also, some of the companies are quite ahead in some of the ECUs and all those kind of things to be updated uh, like uh, every month, every week. And one of the other OEMs uh, are still lagging behind. As a full update in the vehicle through OTA, especially when we talk technically about the LIN and the CAN and all that, it is still not there. We have to be very honest. Whenever th the people talk about the OTA, it's few ECUs connected on the Ethernet or this kind of a bus. Or one so, ECU. Or one ECU. <laughs> just and that just to also. check mark the box. That's right. That, okay, we have an OTA. Yeah. And the rest of the vehicle is still in those days where it was long before. So uh, uh, moving on, uh, so the next kind of uh, epic, both in the industry and your career, is uh, you the electrification and autonomy kind of uh, you know era, which we're we're now in. Um, you rejoined Mercedes in, in 2015 as the SVP of Digital Vehicle and Mobility. 
the kind of uh, L1, you know, vehicle autonomy was really, really the thing there, which is, you know, driver assistance. Um, as we're now kind of getting into L2 is kind of a pretty common product that you can buy, as especially in premium vehicles. Um, what do you think? And it's been a painful road, you know, the last nine years. What do you think uh, the OEMs broadly could have done to make this journey a little easier? Are there areas they should have focused on more, areas they should have focused on less? Because yeah. uh, it's, it's a very good question, because there had been two kind of a think tanks back then in 2015 and 16. And I remember when we were having, at that time, also the board discussion in the industry and all those kind of things. There were a couple of people, they were saying, and they were kind of claiming that we have the L4, like autonomous driving, is going on a massive scale in 2018 and 19. And everyone was just claiming it, that thing, as if it's just happening. And of course, then you're sitting over there and taking board decisions, and you're saying, oh, if they are doing it, they are doing it, they are doing it, and we don't have it, what's going to happen over there? Do, do you think executives were saying those because they didn't, they genuinely believed it, they didn't know the timelines? Because where, where, that seems to be such a miss. I think it was more also coming from the startup perspective also yeah. that a couple of companies were saying as a startups, oh, we have it, we, we're just going to launch it in 12 months and all that without taking the names of those startups uh, in public. And at that time, I remember I was always saying to everyone, whatever I have seen in the industry, we don't have to panic. We just go our way and we go step by step. And I have had always been the believer that, okay, this thing going to come incrementally. It won't go that you don't have even L2 plus, which we call it today, and then tomorrow you have L4 automatically on a broad scale and all those kind of things. And now looking back, I think it was the right way to think about that thing. Now we are in 2024 and we still see that it's not only the development of the compute box or the algorithms on the, in the one ECU, it's also how far the sensor can look, whether it's a LiDAR, radar, or camera, and how efficient they have got. These things are developing. Incrementally, the technology will come, and it will also have a broad like, kind of a implementation, but it would also, there will also be the vehicles with the L2 plus or L2 plus plus out. In the I, mean, I think the, a part of it is the nobody in any of the boardrooms wants to hear, you know, incremental autonomy is the thing. They, they really want breakthroughs, and I think, I think that human psychology kind of plays into it, uh, into it as well. So I think going forward, is the view that we should continue to expect incremental you know, changes in, in, in whether it's autonomy or electrification? Um, and then how do you resist that pressure you have on the other side of a China or a Tesla, uh, which is really pushing the envelope pretty aggressively pretty quickly? Uh, I think one thing is that okay, the things are going incrementally and they are going incrementally worldwide. I think on that point, we all have an agreement that it is the development of the sensors, compute box, and all those kind of things. And I think there one doesn't have to panic. And generally, the time frame in automotive is also between, let's say, between 12 months and 36 months. Then you can have another kind of a cycle, and you can go on uh, this one. But what's happening at the moment beyond the European industry, what we see is on the technological side, that this cycle, it's faster at the moment in other continents than we, what we see over there in our uh, place. And there we have a catch up. I think we have to do that and we have to work hard. We have to optimize a couple of our processes. We have to keep our DNA intact because there must be a reason why a couple of companies are there over 75 years or longer because they kept and they saw again and again after 15 or 20 years something new came. There was a hype of the Japanese car makers were coming and those kind of a production systems and all that. And the industry has had been very resilient on that thing. And I'm a believer in that thing that, okay, this is coming. Now the new wave of technology is coming either from software perspective or electrification perspective. We can still take this ride and we can go on this wave. I think we don't have to worry about that thing. But we of course have to work extremely hard and super hard because the people from other continents, they are also putting, it's like how many hours you are investing in the game. So, and if the more hours we invest, the more we're gonna lead the hub. Yeah, the, there's a great Bill Gates line, which is like a technology doesn't change in two years, but it, everything changes in 10. So if you look back in an ADAS system or your phone, two years ago, it seems roughly the same capabilities as today, but you look back 10 years ago, you know, 
no version of 8S is common in, in vehicles and your phones are way, way dumber than they are now. So I think, I think looking forward that that sounds similar, that seems similar. Where, where do you think the L2 path and the L4 path lands for our industry if you extrapolate five to 10 years as you're making you know, decisions now, technical decisions and organizational decisions? Uh, I think uh, L2 plus plus, it will become, it, it is already becoming like the normal norm in our industry at the moment, depending on what type of a vehicle you are talking about. Of course, uh, I mean, I'm coming from Porsche, so we still have the vehicle which the people love to drive and they have fascination about those vehicles and they would love to go on the test racks and all those kind of things. So uh, this is a different segment. But if you are going into another segment of the vehicles which we also have in our group and all that, L2++ is already like kind of a rolling out now. Uh, L3, we know one of the other OEM has already announced. They are already having a limited version of the L3. Limited in that case, you could say in one of the other uh, segment of the, the highways and everything, it is available. Weather conditions are also limited on that thing, because mainly because of the sensors and all those kind of things are being uh, in development. So I think we will see going further. First, we will see still L2++ getting aggressive another three, four years. And then afterward, in parallel, we will see that the L3 will get more broadly, can drive on more number of roads, can go in more different kind of a weather conditions. And then down the road, the scalable L4, we will see. Of course, we have L4 at the moment also available. But from the business perspective and from the scalability perspective, it's not there. And um, and in everything... And by business to, perspective, you mean just literally bomb cost of how to get that product out in the consumer's hands? Right. I mean, at the end, you have to make a business case out of that thing, right? Uh, if there is no business case, the customers are not ready to pay for the heavy sensors and all those kind of things, uh, then also it doesn't make sense uh, to, to do that kind of a technology and to roll it out on millions of cars. We are talking about 85 million cars at the moment, around 85 to 90 million cars per annum from the whole industry. So in those cars, uh, if you would like to deploy a technology which is not paying back, then also it doesn't make sense. I think then it will be dangerous for everyone. Let's, uh, let's talk about today and uh, your, your role at Porsche. Uh, VW Group and Porsche, it's like its own country. Uh, it's half a million people who work there. Um, you joined uh, last year as a, as, a, as a member of the executive uh, board of Car IT. Um, what is the car IT unit? Uh, how, how is that different from Carrier, the, the VW group? Um, just so we're, we're all kind of all speaking the same language. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's a very big question which everyone asks whenever we are also doing the interviews in, in Germany also. Okay, what the Audi is doing, what the Porsche is doing, what the Carriad is doing, and the Volkswagen and all that. Uh, we have come up with a new kind of a working style at the moment uh, as a management also together with our people. So number one is we all are playing the roles in the engineering of the software and electric electronic for our vehicles. All the players together. So we have a very good combined effort. We are working on this thing with a new kind of a methodology. I have, uh, I call it a liquid organization. That means I don't have to really in a hierarchical way own the people in my organization, but technically we are coming together as an experts to make sure that okay, we lead the wave in such a way that okay, we can roll out all the things. So now, if someone has a badge of either Porsche or Cariad, we all are going more content-driven and not hierarchical-driven or the box-driven. This is a new change which we are trying to introduce at the moment in our company. Because it's a cultural change, it takes time. But I see at the moment is the more and more we are walking from the top down also in this case, then everyone is pushing towards uh, that kind of a new culture. The, um, the, 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 the organizational structure is something that I, I, uh, I want to talk about because it doesn't only impact you guys. Uh, we've, this has been a theme throughout the day. Um, what is the most important thing when it comes to building these modern organizations? Doug at the beginning of the day said, hey, the, you know, you have to find who's the most senior person in the company who knows software and how far are they from the CEO or another proxy is how far into a vehicle program is software become a core requirement or, or a defining function. Um, how do you think about this? I mean, is it similar? Is it different? 
I think it's uh, uh, it's similar. So if you uh, are honest, if you are honest with each other, the people who made the career in the automotive industries, they were the people who came from an electromechanical background. And after a while, they came to the decision-making bodies, and now they have to decide about the technology which they had not practiced in their career of this automotive because they did an excellent job on the electromechanical side. And you need that electromechanical. As long as we cannot beam the humans, you need that nice electromechanical vehicle. You need that. So, but in addition to that, you need the software also. So now how could you decide about the software? What kind of an operating system do I need? Do I need a 16-bit, 32-bit, or 64-bit controller? Is it from uh, together with a graphic controller without? What kind of architecture? And uh, should I concentrate everything in one box or 15 box or 20 box or even 100 boxes in one car? And those have had been the very difficult uh, discussions uh, in the automotive industry that how these people can, can decide about those things. Now, from the organization perspective, I would assume that there are very few people who are sitting on the board level in the industry who are coming like myself with a software background. If you would have asked me 20 years ago that, okay, can anyone from a software background can go on the top in the automotive industry, I would have said, no, you need a mechanical background because if you don't have it, you won't get it to the top in this industry. But now it is becoming more and more a common practice and all that. And uh, I do share uh, some of the views of the dark also that okay to push through or let's say to make yourself understandable in this industry what you mean in the world of software it's good for the company it's a difficult task the um, uh, related to this and relevant to us uh, what role do suppliers play in these emerging organizations or, or partners play uh, in, in in this transition I mean you're always going to need headliners seats maybe will always be made by Lear you know, uh, um, what, what, what should they be doing? I mean, we, we see a lot of changes in the supplier ecosystem from the Bosch's, the Conti's, the ZF's, the Aptiv's uh, of the world. I think we have to be honest on that thing that the, in this case, the, the landscape of the, the way we have had been working is changing completely. Until yesterday, we were writing the specs. In German, we were calling them last night. And then we were giving those specs to our suppliers who were excellent in different ECUs. And now this world is completely changing. And that's why we are collaborating so much with the applied uh, over here also, that it's becoming in-house development. But in-house development doesn't mean that everyone has to have a Porsche ID card or something. That's what we are collaborating over here together with the applied intuition also, where we are saying, okay, only in this case, we can develop one stack, which could also become the standard for the industry and everyone can use it. But we would like to take the lead in that thing, in developing together. And in that case, of course, there is a sad part for the classical suppliers that the more and more the things are getting integrated, less and less use of developing from the typical classical first years will be required in the near future of the industry. Um, speaking of changes, I, uh, we've talked about China throughout the day. I want to uh, uh, bring it back here. Um, you, uh, Porsche announced that you'll head the R&D in China in the, uh, in the coming future here. The Chinese EV industry has been booming, to, to say the least, um, and where you're getting kind of very high-quality parts uh, products for $15,000. And for all of those at home, uh, if you're not watching the Chinese, uh, there's YouTube channels that literally cover the Chinese market absolutely fascinating um, of what's actually being delivered and what's in production. It's not in R&D. Uh, wh why do you think Western EV markets are so far behind? Um, and and uh, yeah, I would love to get your kind of knee-jerk reaction to that. I think the R&D office in China uh, is also one of the very typical example for us as Porsche. We are a, I would be very frank, we are a super humble company and we are absolutely and extremely open to learn from anywhere in the world whenever we see something is coming that's why we have an office in the valley also and we are having an office in china and we will we do the super integration is still in Vaisak. we take a very proud of it that thing 
Uh, we produce our, our vehicles also in Germany, so we take a pride, of, uh, pride on that one also. Uh, but in general, of course, you see that there are some of the technologies, because we have had been so successful, as I mentioned before, on the mechanical engineering, on this chemistry of the battery, and then making from the chemistry the cell and cell the module and all those kind of things. This is one of the area where we have had also been very dependent on the uh, supply chain also. I think this is one of the things where I would say that okay, we, we have a catch up uh, mechanism over there that okay, we have to catch this thing. Second thing is, in general, the semiconductor industry also, which is providing the high compute. You also see it's coming from South Korea, including the batteries also, but they are not only coming from China also. There are some other countries also which are doing a good job on uh, that one. And uh, we have one of the other European player also. They are trying to also come up uh, with the challenges they are facing uh, in general, but they are also pushing that thing. So I would assume in the next five years, we will have a more settled um, supply chain on the electrical vehicles and all that also. Uh, Porsche sells a lot of cars in China. Uh, Porsche sells a lot of cars everywhere, but uh, specifically in China. How do you maintain that strong following in an extremely competitive automotive market? It's maybe the most competitive our automotive market globally right now. I think we, we our motto goes like that, that, driven by dreams, right? So we are not bringing any box on the street going from A to B uh, and all that. So I think, and the people appreciate it, our customers, they appreciate it. Uh, that's why uh, until now, and I think in the future also, we will be able to keep uh, that internationally everywhere. We have a long list of the people waiting. Uh, I think uh, we must be doing something right. Uh, our sales team must have been working day and night very hard the, uh, for those kind of a products. So on that thing, I am optimistic in general that as long as there is a, a wish in the, in the dream, in the mind of someone to drive the best car in the world, the first thing that come into their mind will be the Porsche. Yeah, regardless if they're Chinese or not. <laughs> Independent uh, of that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last question. Um, probably a very small fraction of people came here in any version of autonomy. Maybe someone used, some people used FSD uh, coming here. Uh, Waymo doesn't come down here. It stops at Daily City, so you couldn't use a Waymo to come all the way down here. If you're looking forward, crystal ball, uh, when does most of the audience have some version of autonomy, some percentage of the drive to the event is autonomous? Uh, is, that, is that five years, is that 10 years that we're, we're crossing that threshold of maybe 50% of the audience? I'm trying, I'm avoiding these questions for more than 12 years. Um, that's, that's really an honest answer. We so need we, a specific uh, number and, so that we can and, play and, this back at Intersect 2054. <laughs> so if you, if you will look at my interviews of the like kind of a 2015 also or even earlier, I have had always been of the view that it's going to come incrementally. L2++, which is like navigation, uh, navigate on pilot, that kind of a thing is coming now where you could already drive, let's say, a couple of minutes, more than an hour, but it's still the driver is in charge. And uh, the full upcoming like L4 everywhere, every kind of a weather condition, the way we drive today, uh, it's going to take a while. 